Next on Hard Talk, I'm taking an exclusive look inside one of the world's biggest construction projects in Saudi Arabia. But the oil price has crashed and are some of the Saudis' big dreams about to be turned to dust? This is BBC World News. Now Hard Talk with Stephen Sacker. Welcome to a special edition of Hard Talk from Saudi Arabia with me, Stephen Sacker. This country was built on oil riches. Now it's having to cope with the oil price crash. I've come to one of the world's biggest construction projects, King Abdullah economic city. Now it's projected to be home to two million people, a global city here in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. My guest is the CEO of this place, Fahed Al Rashid. Due to the economic problems here, could his dream be about to turn to dust? Fahid Al Rashid, welcome to Hard Talk and thank you for inviting me onto this extraordinary project. Tell me, how do you feel every day when you come onto what must be one of the biggest building sites in the world? Uh, I love it. There is nothing like coming to a construction site if you are in business of construction and development. I get an adrenaline shot every time I'm here. And how much change do you see day by day, week by week? How, how quickly are things happening here? Well, when our visitors come, they see the big stuff. I see the small stuff. I see this uh, uh, little concrete's been poured here, little piece of uh, another floor here. So I, so I see the difference actually every day. It's important to give people a sense of the scale of this. I mean, we're talking about a city that's going to be the same size as Washington, D.C. You say it's going to have two million residents. I mean, it is extraordinary to build that from scratch in the desert. Uh, absolutely. You have to remember that 65% of our population is under 30. In fact, because of population migration into Riyadh and Jeddah, they are some of the fastest growing cities in the world. We, knew, we need new urban centers like this, and we get people to, to move here by offering jobs. But it seems to me when this dream was hatched, Saudi Arabia was the dominant player in the oil market, the oil price was going up, and there was a sense that Saudi could pretty much do anything it wanted. Things are very different now. Well, Cake uh, was launched. Uh, when you say Cake, you mean King Abdullah Economic King City? King Abdullah Economic City. We like to call it Cake. Um, but uh, uh, when it was launched by King Abdullah in 10 years ago, uh, the idea was for the kingdom to prepare for a moment like this when oil prices are not so high, where the government needs private sector involvement across the whole economy. Um, and uh, we are here. In fact, despite all of the economic news that is uh, about oil prices and about the economy of Saudi Arabia slowing down, we signed up 23 new companies in 2015. And when you talk about being an international hub, you have to persuade people that Saudi Arabia is a great place to do business. And I'm not sure the world really believes that right now. Well, it is a great place to do business. I think it is more of an image. I'll give you one example. It takes in the U.S. six years to get a construction permit on infrastructure. It takes us here three weeks, and uh, if it uh, doesn't come on time, we complain. What do you believe is the main priority right now? You're talking about a port. And you say is going to be one of the top ten ports in the world. You're talking about building uh, an industrial base. What's this city's sort of unique selling point going to be? Well, the first, the first ten years we focus on being a global logistics and manufacturing hub. We built the port. It's going to be one of the top ten ports in the world and the largest on the Red Sea uh, by the end of this year, actually. Uh, we have attracted 120 companies from around the world, so we know this concept works and it's going to continue uh, into the future. What we are now focused on is on the residential sector, on tourism, and some services like healthcare and education. Tourism? Yes. You, you, you think Saudi Arabia is going to be a magnet for tourists? I am confident it will be. In fact, our numbers show that we'll be, have one million people by 2020 20 visiting the city and three and a half million uh, people by 2025. But ask me why. 
Well, uh, listen, I ask the questions you don't, but on this occasion I will. Why? Because it's an interesting question. Um, because we are already the 17th most visited country in the world because of Hajj al-Amrah. Uh, so because of the pilgrims yes, coming to Mecca. Exactly. Yeah. And the government intends on doubling that number in the next five years, uh, as well as Saudis. All right, well, Fahad al-Rashid, you've laid out some of the vision for me. Let's go to your office and perhaps we can challenge you a little bit more. So, Saudi Arabia is entering an age of austerity. And it seems to me this extraordinary city project is about extravagance, not austerity. I think it is about fundamentals. What you, if you see what we've built, everything that we've built is based on what Saudi Arabia needs or the region needs. So we're talking about port. We need a lot of logistics and transport infrastructure. Uh, you talk about industry, we have huge and ample energy that we're using. And you talk about residents, we need to build 4 million housing units in the country in the next 10 years. So we're just tapping into the potential of the country. But think back to when this project was conceived. You know, it was a different era. We're talking about 2005. King Abdullah was on the throne. It looked as though Saudi Arabia could be guaranteed to be the dominant oil producer in the world forever and that the world would always be reliant on Saudi oil. That isn't true today and that changes everything, doesn't it? Well, the vision of King Abdullah and of the government at the time uh, was to create a, a, a new project, uh, a new era of development where the private sector leads uh, the, in development and infrastructure investment. I think that King Abdullah Economic City was actually launched for exactly this moment, this moment when the government can do everything and that uh, the government needs to rely on the private sector and I think it's working. But in the end you can't divorce yourself from the economic picture in the country as a whole. Yes, your private sector, but in the end if the Saudi economy is going to slow fundamentally because the oil price has plummeted and it doesn't look as though it's going to rise anytime soon, then you have a problem. Well, we depend not only on the Saudi economy, on the regional economy, but and on the global economy. I don't mind being in the Saudi economy today. We're going to grow at 4%. It's also about the regional picture. I mean, here you sit on the Red Sea in the middle of a region that is full of turbulence, turmoil, war, and uncertainty about the future. That's a terrible problem, too. Well, I think that um, uh, people forget that the Middle East has, has challenges uh, for the past few years. Um, you can talk about the 80s, the war, Iraq and Iran, um, and uh, uh, the U.S. and Iraq in the 90s, uh, I'm sorry, in, the, in the, the Gulf War in the 90s, and the second Gulf War in the beginning 2000, then the Arab Spring. We're kind of used to it, and uh, so Saudi Arabia has been the uh, stable place uh, throughout all of it. So. You've been in the country, you've seen it, you've been to Riyadh, uh, you've been to Jeddah. Does this look to you like a country that's in turmoil? Well, I've talked to a lot of people, many of whom talk about uncertainty and talk about challenges facing the kingdom unlike any that they've seen before. And it comes back to this point about whether investors are going to see this as the time to get involved with a speculative venture such as your new city. Well, I think that you are seeing today a different era for Saudi Arabia. Uh, an era that's going to see reform, uh, really a restructuring of the economy. But I think what people are mostly worried about is the pace of change. We're seeing today a dynamic government, a government that is willing to take the hard, uh, to make the hard decisions. What used to take 12 months is now taking a month uh, to get done. So I think people are just not used to this pace of change, by the way, not, uh, neither internally nor externally. Yeah, you, you, you tell me that this is very much a private sector project. In the end, though, there have been several occasions, I'm thinking about 2008 with the global financial crisis, again, I think in 2011, when you've had to go to your government and plead for emergency loans because you were running out of cash. Well, this is uh, what we call a public-private partnership. Yes, it's led by the private sector, but you cannot build a city without the government. This cannot be devoid of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia or the region. It is built for them. So no, no, uh, no project at this scale can work without working with the government. And that's the government the, that, yeah. if I may say so, is precisely the point. Let me quote to you from a leaked memo from King Salman's office that was published in Time magazine just a few weeks ago. The memo goes like this. It's marked highly confidential. It gives strict instructions for the stopping of all new projects, for all public sector purchases, including new vehicles and other equipment. That's the mindset of the government today, a government that you still ultimately rely on to be your backstop. 
Well, I think that today, um, if you look at the private sector and what's happening in the private sector, like I said, 2015, despite all of the challenges, we signed 23 uh, companies. Our sales in re residential were very healthy. And over the next 10 years, by the way, over the first 10 years, we developed 40 projects. Our current business plan for the next 10 years includes 170 projects, so a five times increase in, in, in development. So numbers prove it. It's not about Well, sentiment. I know you like numbers. Here's another number for yeah. you. The uh, marine traffic index that I looked at for, I think it was November of last year, it showed that on any given day you had an average of three or four vessels in port, yeah. whereas the port of Jeddah, literally as we sit here just down the coast, the port of Jeddah had 44 vessels in port with another 42 en route. And then if you go to Jebel Ali in the UAE and a whole bunch of other ports, including Dubai, they're all so much busier than your new port. Yeah. Well, uh, I think the num these numbers don't show the potential of our port. We have a 3 million container port today, rising to be 4 plus by end of this year. We have three of the top five shipping lines uh, in the world moving there. So. I am very confident about the future and actually we're going to continue to build to make this one of the top 20 ports in the world. So far we've focused on the global and regional economic context. Let, let's sort of switch focus a little bit and talk about the, the, the political, the cultural climate in Saudi Arabia and in your new city. Is not your biggest problem that the outside world's perception of Saudi Arabia is that it is deeply conservative and repressive and that is not an atmosphere in which people want to invest want to come and live and establish new businesses and new lives well I think the if that is the picture that is the wrong picture because I think Saudi Arabia for the longest time uh, is seen with a static lens uh, what I see is a Saudi Arabia that's very dynamic that is changing quite rapidly to be honest with you Stephen I don't think we in the country understand the pace of change ten years ago let's talk about women Ten years ago, there was no woman on a board. You cannot be a CEO if you're a woman. Um, you, definitely not in our uh, Shura Council, our form of uh, parliament. So all of this changed very rapidly. Today, 20% of our Shura Council is women. We just elected women into the municipal councils. Yeah, I mean, frankly, and that was a bit of a, a showpiece yeah. election. It doesn't indicate really fundamental change. And <laughs> frankly, the biggest change of all would be if if my female colleagues working on the hard talk program were able to come to your city and drive themselves here but that's simply not possible because you cannot yeah. insulate yourself from the deep conservatism in this country I think um, to say that elections that have uh, been held uh, and women elected uh, are uh, local council elections yes, this has they, nothing to do with who really wields the power no, in but Saudi this is Arabia. progress and if you look at who wields the power today there are more than uh, graduates that are women than are men from college my point is about progress and that, that the world does not understand where Saudi is today and I would put it to you uh, Fahad al Rashid that you are a very particular kind of Saudi you are educated in the United States, you have been to business school, you are open-minded, and you are not representative of the religious establishment in this country, and you're frankly not representative of the mindset of the ruling family either. I don't think I'm representative of anything but, uh, or anyone but myself, right? Today, um, Saudis are not uh, one form of person. We are very different. Um, talking about people who are graduating from the US, we have 160,000 people around the world right now graduating youth. They will come, they will change the country in fundamental ways. Well, let's talk about the change then. I mean, uh, let's be specific. You're telling international investors to come here, to live here, to yes. make this place their future. Will there be a presence of the religious police, the Murtawa here? Well, I don't think it, that's the issue. I think the issue well, is all it about... It is an important issue. I just want to know. Yeah. For example, a talented young woman businesswoman. She yeah. wants to come here as part of a team establishing a new company. She wants to believe she's going to have a good life here. Will she be able to insulate herself from the rules that uh, govern life in Riyadh, for example? Can she live a different life? Can she do the things that she would do if she lived in the United States or Europe or many other parts of the world. Well, you, you should remember that uh, we are still in Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia today is, is like I said earlier, a very dynamic place. Um, we ourselves are struggling between modernity and tradition. Uh, we have the highest use of, uh, for example, social media today in the world per, per capita. 
to be honest with you, what the country would look at like in 30, 40 years, I don't know. What uh, would you like? What would you like it to look like in 30 or 40 years? Well, I, I, I think that the, the, the country and the way I see direction uh, going today is that uh, we will have all of this youthful energy coming back into the country. Women are taking their place in society. Uh, but uh, the Saudi persona, if you will, what it means to be Saudi is still um, not clear. Uh, because we are, by the way, a society that, uh, that uh, have different strata of people on income, on religion, 30% of the population is non-Saudi. Uh, and so the country itself is a young country. And uh, what it will look like in the future will be the dynamism um, I, of I just all think of these maybe you're forces. being a little diplomatic, a little tactful, but is your message to the rulers of this kingdom that they need to accept change? Um, I think they're leading change, to be honest with you, today. Really? But, yes, absolutely. I mean, but just hang on. Y yeah. You often say, uh, in public, you say, we are going to be an island of change. We're going to bring the world to Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia to the world. And you compare yourselves here in this new city to Dubai. But there's a fundamental difference. In Dubai, the authorities there have accepted all sorts of different lifestyles. They have attracted Western money, Western tourists, Western business people, because they've been so flexible. Are you telling me that you can achieve that here? Well, Dubai is a bit different because it's a traffic generating model. Uh, they have to attract people from all around the world. For us, we but are... You say you want to do that? No, we do. We want to track, uh, attract investment and foreign direct investment, definitely. Um, and we have done so. But my point is we have huge potential in the country, huge needs in the country for the Saudi population that are not addressed. We don't need to um, attract people to do tourism uh, here that uh, are, uh, um, that th these are not the same people that go to Dubai. Uh, we will have about 30 million visitors for Hajj and Amr. They're already coming. They have visas and they want a conservative family op uh, oriented approach. And that is exactly uh, the target market we are going to do. The other, tar uh, to, ad to address the other target is Saudis themselves. They also need a destination. So we're going to build zoos, go uh, golf courses, um, um, uh, theme parks, hotels for those segments. But you're going to do it in a Saudi way and in a very traditional way. Uh, I hope so. We have to. Uh, it means that th you are in Saudi Arabia. This is a sense of place. So on the golf course yeah. that you're going to build here, will women and men golfers be able to play together? Definitely. Why not? Well, I, I don't know why not, but, but I know that it's difficult for women to play golf in this country, partly because of the clothing laws. You know. well, but we'll figure that out. We're building an, uh, a new industry. So, but again, uh, it's, uh, it's not about the tactics. It's about the direction. How can we create uh, a new place uh, in Saudi Arabia that is respectful of the Saudi tradition, but at the same time is modern, that, but reflects the local condition, the local needs, and the target markets that we are looking uh, to serve? One of the key points made by um, the Deputy Crown Prince as he delivers what he calls his economic transformation model is to ensure that more jobs are done by Saudis and fewer jobs are done by uh, foreigners in Saudi Arabia. And I think construction is one area that he's been looking at. Uh, you've taken me on a quick tour of construction. There's an awful lot going on, but I did notice that many of the workers that I saw were not Saudis. Is, is that going to change? Well, I think the challenge with this is that we have opened our economy, uh, unlike most countries in the world, to expatriate workers. And they get paid um, um, uh, a, a, an amount of money that is reflective of their economic opportunity of their country. So that is below typically what a Saudi uh, would make to live. So that's the challenge. We are going to change that over time by training Saudis. Uh, they, they are now accepting. Um, jobs that they used to not accept, to be honest with you. The, uh, the, uh, you can um, uh, look at our port operations room today. They are all women from uh, villages around us. Um, it took a year to train them. Uh, so we are very, uh, we are big believers that Saudis, when trained properly and helped to get a job, that they would actually do it. But it's partly about a mindset, isn't it? I mean, are you telling me that you believe Saudis in King Abdullah Economic City are going to be prepared to? to do the construction work, to do the garbage collection, to do uh, some of the most basic laboring tasks which for decades in this country have been done by overseas expatriate workers. I don't see a reason why they can't do that.
Have you told this to your Saudi neighbors? I mean, it just seems to me this is not a society right now that accepts that. You know, you still, despite the austerity the government is now talking about, you still get huge subsidies, you still live off oil resources, and I don't think most Saudis feel or see the need to do the kinds of jobs you're talking about. I think this is a um, generalization. I understand where it's coming from, but I know a lot of Saudis that are willing to do any job. We see them every day. We train them, by the way. We have programs that train um, uh, Saudis from the villages around us. Go to the hotel. You'll see them working different jobs. Mm -hmm. So it is all about the environment uh, that you offer. If you offer the right environment and you select properly, um, then you'll, you'll see that they, can, they will do the job. What about sustainability? We haven't talked yeah. about that. It is an extraordinary view here because essentially beyond the, the, the fancy housing complex and this beautiful office headquarters, you've got desert. And it does seem odd, in a way, building a vast new city in the middle of the desert, adding goodness knows how much carbon emissions to the atmosphere when the world's governments have just pledged themselves to decarbonizing the world economy. How are you going to justify this project? Well, actually, we're very careful uh, when it comes to uh, um, building sustainably. When this project was launched 10 years ago, um, you will see the master plan. It looked like a Venice. It was beautiful, but it has nothing to do, nothing to do with the environment in which we uh, exist. Then I uh, was in New York during Hurricane Sandy, and I saw the full power of nature and what what nature would do to you if you try to actually over engineer over uh, cement over concrete mm. the place and when I came back I said this is not going to work we have to make it an ecologically friendly city so we actually removed all the canals allowed water to flow where it wanted to and minimized use I really focus on conservation a lot I think conservation is the most important form of sustainability so it will cut actually 40 percent of our uh, carbon uh, produced if we just focus on this area. Now we are saying that the world is changing. We are on the, our fourth master plan, by the way, and uh, we just agreed uh, at CAKE that the master plan that we have, although it's probably the most modern master plan today in the world, should be scrapped. And the reason for this is I don't know yet how the Internet of Things, how the driverless car, how the sharing, sharing economy will change the way our city should look. I think we are building great cities today, but they are not 21st century cities. We still don't understand what a 21st century city should look like. So you've just scrapped your master plan. So do you, do you mean you have no plan at all at the moment? No, hypothetically. <laughs> anyway, the master plan uh, should not uh, be so exact about what you do. It should tell you what not to do. But just coming back to this point about how you reduce emissions and yes. make this as close to carbon neutral as you can, I, I was sort of expecting, given that we're here in Saudi Arabia where the sun is always shining pretty much, I was expecting to see vast uh, solar arrays to power this place. Yeah. But I don't see uh, any investment in solar at all. Well, solar uh, on its own is very effective but it's not effective it's not it's not coupled with storage so now our new homes that we are producing in 2017 will not only have solar panels but will include batteries as well uh, that is the idea that we have it's not about showing you uh, a showy nice area where it has lots of solar panels and I'll tell you it's about number one conserve so don't even um, um, use what you don't need and then second actually introduce technologies that actually work both economic economically and technologically Back in the day of King Abdullah, there was talk of six new economic cities for Saudi Arabia. Yes. You're still going. There are one or two others that are still staggering along, but a lot of the planning has been shelved. You may be the last one standing, and you may not make it either. I believe we will make it, first of all. Uh, it is happening, so that is not in question, uh, question in my mind. However, building a city is not easy. I've learned this the hard way. There are 247,000 cities around the world. This is the most competitive space, uh, if you will, for a product, a city. Uh, so each city has its own path, uh, needs to really be, be, uh, be zooming into why it needs to exist. Mm. And to, you need uh, then committed uh, government or private sector developer that will actually make it happen despite all of the challenges. I think the other economic cities will actually happen. Not all of them, there are four now, by the way. Uh, but uh, they have just taken a very different path uh, to success. Well, I hope I can return, but for now, Fahad Al Rashid, thank you for being on Hard Talk. Thank you for having me.
Get news you can trust on social media. We're the most shared international news brand on Twitter and have over 70 million Facebook likes. So whether you want the latest breaking news or stories you simply have to share, more and more people are turning to BBC News. Share, like and follow on social media and get involved.